Welcome everyone. This is Holly Drake and this is our very first virtual Foraging Friday where we're going to be surfing nature's wave together and cooking together. Um, let me explain a little bit about what that's going to be like but first I want you to know that if you go to my website which is wildblessings.com you'll be able to sign up and be a part of my contact list so I can let you know when, when things are coming out. And also, by doing so, you'll get my very favorite handout, which I created of my favorite wild edibles. There's so many more thousands of wild edible plants than what I've got here, but these are my favorite leaves and shoots and buds and so forth, roots and so forth. So um, that's a wonderful bucket list. And you can print that out and then be able to highlight the ones that you can identify, the ones you've eaten, and um, we'll be spending probably an hour on each of these plants over the years. And so the difference between Teaching Tuesdays and Foraging Fridays is as follows. Teaching Tuesday is where I will be teaching in depth about the plants and it's from 11 a.m. till noon Eastern Standard Time on Facebook. We have a private Facebook group called Wild Blessings with Holly Drake. And so if you don't belong to that already, then just shoot me a private message or text me or whatever, and I'd be happy to invite you to our community. Uh, we learn not only about plants in detail, but we'll talk about different topics, the restorative power of nature. We just did a topic on the moon cycles and gardening and foraging with the moon. So that's a, a free resource, and it's a wonderful community of like-minded kindred spirits. Um, so that's Tuesdays and then on Fridays this is my for my patreon members we will be surfing nature's wave together cooking wild recipes and um, I'll be teaching you so much more I've done this many 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 times in person but now we're doing it virtual so you'll get to go with me as I go to all my different shopping centers, the Cat Tail Swamp, Todd Island Park, all over the place where I collect things as they come into the seasonal um, um, opportunities, which are very narrow windows in foraging. So this will be a great way for you to stay on top of Nature's Wave with me. Okay, just in review of Teaching Tuesday this last week, we talked about the scripture that says to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven and this is what we were discussing with the moon cycles that if you can follow the cycles of the moon then you'll be able to work smarter and not just harder so here's the moon um, calendar of the cycles of May 2021 so starting on the 3rd of May to the 11th of May, that was the fourth quarter of the moon, and the, and the cycles are in quarters. So now we're in the first quarter of the moon where the moon is waxing and starts out with absolutely no moon. So a new moon on the 11th is no moon, but it starts to get stronger and stronger as the uh, pull on the earth. And so this is the time well, let's go back to the fourth quarter. So during the fourth quarter, which was May the 3rd through May the 11th, that is the best time to mow for decreased growth. So this is such a great time not to do any planting, just to do prep work, to do weeding, to do uh, mowing, of uh, weed whacking, so that you don't have to be constantly out there mowing again. So it really does help. It really does work this way. The Farmer's Almanac, um, people have done this for centuries following the moon cycles. It's just, um, if you want to learn more, you can go to my, hear my talk on that, and where I've also given lots of links that you can learn more. Um, but now we're in the first quarter, which is May the 11th through May the 19th. And so, like I said, the no moon equals a new moon, and this is the time to plant annuals and grains to trim to actually increase growth and start tinctures so that's just so wise and uh, knowing when to do things so I would never do all the mowing I did last week this week because I'd have to turn around and do it again really quick okay we also talked last Tuesday about befriending burdock which is truly one of my absolute favorite wild edible plants I have so much respect for this plant um, I passed by the field of the sluggard 
and by the vineyard of the man lacking sense. And behold, it was completely overgrown with thistles, and its surface was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. And when I saw, I reflected upon it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Then your poverty will come as a robber, and your want like an armed man. That's Proverbs 24, 30 through 34. And I'll, you'll understand why I shared that verse in just a minute. If you'd have never had an experience with eating burdock, I promise you, you've had experience with its burrs. These annoying hitchhikers, these seed pods are um, pretty infamous. This is what burdock is most well known for. Farmers have a hard time, uh, especially sh with sheep and cattle getting burrs all in their hair. So burdock has seizing qualities that are just saying, spread me with their seeds. Burrs and thistles may seem like a curse as described in the verse that I read up above, but to an, a, an herbalist or a wild person who appreciates the hidden blessings in burrs and nettles, they're kind of celebrated. I hope by that, as by the time I finish sharing these few slides with you, you will have a great deal of interest in learning more about burdock. The seizing quality of these hooked seed pods ensure that the seeds will be carried far and wide as they hitchhike on fur or clothing. If you look up close at these, this beautiful picture, look at those little tiny hooks. This picture was taken by Alex Hyde. It's just stunning. Um, but interestingly, these infuriating hooked seed pods became, became inspiration for the creation of Velcro by, um, as an ingenious fastener. So Velcro is over there on the right hand side. Dr. George de Mestrel, he is a Swiss engineer in the 50s. He inspected burdock um, hooks closely under a microscope and upon examining their really simple design and the, hoop, the loops he developed and patented Velcro in the early 1950s. So his these fresh new ideas came just by observing nature and seems like a random association but it was a brilliant design which God made and then he just mimicked it his creation of velcro completely changed things from zippers and and uh, buckles to velcro which we use now for just about everything during his lifetime his company sold an average of over 60 million yards of velcro per year fascinating so burdock is a biennial which means its growth cycle lasts for two years the first year the energy is in its tasty, nutritious roots, and the leaves are large like elephant ears, and they grow from like a basil rosette, collecting energy that they store in their roots. The second year, the energy shoots up the stalk, a tall stalk, sometimes up to 10 feet tall, creating prickly purple flowers that morph into those irksome prickly seed pods that we just talked about. Though the roots are no longer edible, um, there is a delectable inner pith in the fat stalk, which we'll talk about in a minute. The roots are hard to dig, so they can be really long. Um, and the tastiest part is the part that's deepest in the earth. Um, however, I have found that the best time to dig for the root is in the first year of its growth or in the spring of the second year before the energy shoots up the seed stalk and the root is just tough and it's fibrous. So there's all kinds of techniques that um, of getting the roots up without breaking too much of it off. But I personally like to break off the tip because it means it'll just keep growing and it's just encouraging um, more growth. And as far as I'm concerned, I can't have enough burdock close by. Okay. Compost piles are the best. I think I actually practically pulled this out with my hand. This was in a compost pile at the ASU farm and um, it was so easy to get up. The Japanese find this to be a delicacy. They call it gobo and they grow it in trash can type things. And they, uh, so it's very easy for them to harvest and the roots grow very straight without any rocks or anything in the way. 
Um, once the roots are harvested and cleaned, there are numerous tasty ways to prepare this nutritious delicacy. And my favorite way uh, to clean the roots is in the river, especially with the sand. You just kind of take the root and just work it back and forth into the um, soil or into the sand and it helps to get the dirt off. You don't want to put that down your sink or if you have to bring it home then you can use it with a hose. Okay so what would you do with these groceries? This is all of my burdock sitting here on the counter ready to go. I've cleaned the roots and I've got the stems all ready to eat. I'm certainly not going to eat the leaves but we'll talk about what they do in a minute. So what I see when I look at this is I see sweet and sour burdock roots, I see stir fries, I see stews, roasted root casseroles, pickled burdock root, I see tacos and I bur uh, burgers and meatballs and all kinds of wonderful things that I've made with the burdock root. But the stems are also delicious. Um, the stems of the burdock plant can be enjoyed if they're tender and juicy and not rigid and stiff. So de-string them because they kind of have a stringiness to them. You can use just your fingernails or just um, a peeler. And then to parboil them and use them as green beans or celery and they can be pickled. I just marinated some in some um, wonderful Mediterranean spices. Oh, and the other thing is putting it directly into lemon water is a good thing because it will keep the um, keep it from oxidizing. Here's some of the burdock root that's sliced on an angle and it looks like it's already been cooked to be al dente uh, which means now I can use it to make all those different recipes and I'll provide those recipes for you and that'll be really helpful on in your wild um, cooking. Okay so decocting always begin with cold water um, can't remember why that is but I know that when it comes to root vegetables starting with cold water is the best best idea okay I always save the peels um, there's a lot of nutrition in the um, epidermis there and so you I you can even just keep it on and eat it that way or if you want to have it looking more palatable you can peel it off but then I could definitely use the peels for making stock or bone broths you can freeze that until you're ready to make your broth um, this I have since learned since I made did this picture that to put it in lemon water is a great way to keep it from oxidizing even if it does turn dark it still has the same flavor and it really only just looks dirty but it's not okay with all of that decocted and decant um, al dente burdock root. I've made burdock hamburgers which are delicious <laughs> and tacos. So basically once you get it chopped up and tender the way you want it like this then you just season it with taco seasoning. Uh, I've made it into mushrooms for chicken piccata and it has everything to do with seasoning. Preparation is pretty much the key here and I'll be teaching you those techniques in the recipes. Meatballs with burdock. My favorite way I think is the sweet and sour and the recipe for this is just so simple. It's honey and soy sauce, toasted uh, sesame oil and sesame seeds and then you just marinate it in that and then serve it over some rice. This salad is 100% wild except for the tomatoes. And then not only is it a super edible gift, but it's an amazing um, medicinal gift as well. It's such an awesome healing plant. The best way to get the medicinal benefits of burdock is to eat it, in letting food be your medicine and medicine be your food. But you can make tinctures of the roots and the seeds. They have great healing value as well. Burdock is an alterative, a diuretic, a diaphoretic, a bitter, a demulcent, an anodyne, anti-tumoral, antiseptic, and it's a cell proliferant, which um, is amazing. So the Amish would gather and dry the burdock roots, which is what I'm doing here, and storing them in their hospitals to use with burn patients. 
They are an anodyne, which means it's a pain reliever, which dulls pain. They're antiseptic, the burdock leaves, and they kill germs as an antiseptic. As a cell proliferant, they multiply new cell, cell growth, and they don't stick to the wound. So there's just amazing stories to read of um, how burn victims who used the burdock leaf as a poultice did not um, have scars and they would heal so much quicker and their blood would coagulate well because they weren't using as much pain medications. So fascinating and um, there's just so many wonderful practical uses as well. So the burdock seed are wonderful, va highly valued for their medicine. Their impact is a lot faster than the more long lasting steady um, working of the entire whole plant, but it doesn't last as long. So harvesting the seeds though is quite a challenge. <laughs> Look at how Bethany's wearing um, gloves because these little splinters get stuck in your fingers and it's not fun. Um, the way to get them out best is to stick them in a paper bag and then just um, actually Jim McDonald rolls over them with his car, with the, with the wheels of the car. But here's Bethany using a, a rolling pin. So yeah, it's a challenge, but it's worth it. Okay, and then burdock's usefulness and playfulness. You can use them for plates. I've used them many times for plates. Um, this was the original baggie. You know, imagine putting a sandwich in there and then folding it up tightly and putting a rubber band around it would be a way to keep your sandwich fresh. Um, you can use it for a fan. <laughs> These huge leaves are so versatile or an umbrella when it's raining, I've done that. Um, the bandages we've already talked about, or handy wipes, they have a really absorbent quality. Um, toilet paper, <laughs> and way better than mullen in my opinion. Um, my neighbor used to use it for poop patrol. And then um, the Indians used to give fresh burdock root to their little ones who were teething, and it would work to quiet them down and soothe their gums, and uh, so nutritious for them as well. And then for defleeing pets, you can simmer a handful of brown um, burrs, burdock burrs, and strain and cool off this infusion to wash your pets and kill fleas quickly. Lots of fun and practical uses for burdock. Okay, so that's just review. If you wanted to really go deep into that, you can go to the Teaching Tuesday class uh, in the archives and see that. Now we're going to, you're going to join me as we forage together and see what, how, where I was foraging this week. Okay. Look at all that blue cohosh. This is Max. Okay, that's a woods nearby that Max and I go to pretty much every day. Um, there's so much there to forage for. First, I'm going to talk about what nature's wave is. So riding nature's wave is the art of harvesting God's edible plant gifts at the peak of their energy when they are the most nutritious and tasty. This skill of consuming leaves and shoots and stems, buds, flowers, pods, fruits, seeds, roots, or bark for food and healing used to be common knowledge. Each season highlights new treasures to be gathered and enjoyed. So in the winter, the energy is stored in the roots and the bark. In the spring, the energy transfers to the young shoots and leaves. In the summer, the energy bursts forth up the stem into the flower buds and then the flowers and the fruits. And in the fall, the energy is spent making seeds and fruit. And after the first frost, the energy dies back into the roots to store up for spring and begins the cycle again. So this week on Nature's Wave, we'll start with the edible roots, which we I did a lot of digging of burdock. And um, it's just such a vibrant and amazing plant. I was searching for morels 
like every day for during morel season i think we're almost out of morel season and i never did find any but if you did then let me know and i can rejoice with you but there's such there's such a delicacy and they're so in evasive they just tend to um i don't know they're just hard to find nobody will ever tell me where their morel stash is because it's kind of a secret amongst foragers so here is another video in the forest about ramps and hellebores. Max and I are out looking for morels. They love poplar trees and there's lots of those in this woods. There's a lot of wild ginger and there's some false hellebore, which looks sort of like ramps. But you can see the difference to the real thing. This is poisonous. It's in a lily family as well, but it's not edible. It has a completely different Flower again, the Look at the trillions. So cute. Oh, this wild ginger. What did you find, Max? So, let's look in. Oh, look at this. I don't know what that is. <laughs> oh my goodness. Look at all the May apples. If I find one, I'll show you. So let's not wrap up the top floor. And this is a ramp. The key is that they smell like it. Oh, that's a kill gosh. Look at the way that leaf is shaped of the wild ginger. So interesting. Okay, so here's a large ramp patch here on the left. And just a little bit of a, um, a few tips. Uh, it's really best to harvest from the middle of a patch like this because you wanna keep sustainably uh, harvesting. And so they spread by seed. So leaving um, the ones on the outskirts alone so they can spread out is a, a wise one of the wise ideas. Another thing you can do is just simply take one of the leaves of of the plants so that they can continue to grow. It takes seven years to grow to this point um, to, of with the bulbs like this and this size. So um, you don't want to decimate any of these uh, wild edibles. You want to just be very careful in the way and thoughtful in the way in which you harvest. Um, so what I like to do is I like to dig up the roots the bulbs and then I just cut with a sharp knife the rootlets and then put it right back into the ground and what I've done a lot of is taking those rootlets back to my house and then just putting them in my backyard and it's done very well at taking off and continuing to grow the following season so uh, ramps are such a hot commodity right now in the foraging world in an elite restaurants so there a lot of people um, tend to just take too many but they're such so delicious and there's some really wonderful ways in which you can preserve them so we'll talk about that in a second first let's just briefly talk about the lookalikes so this is the hellebore that i discussed in the video and you can see how it's got the ribbing on the on the leaves and they're wider than the ramps there's two different types of ramps there's the red stemmed and the white stemmed and the red stems tend to have a larger bulb and a fatter 
leaf so they can be almost as fat as a hellebore but they don't have the ridge lines in it and also the hellebore the key is it does not smell like garlic or onion at all um, a lot of people have been foraging during since COVID I think um, maybe they're just thinking maybe I should learn what's free for the no one and the picking and so they just would take a false hellebore cut it all up and throw it in their spaghetti and then get very sick so it's just so important that you know what the poisonous lookalikes are and that you educate yourself but it's really a matter of um, it's not rocket science and it's not hard to figure out there's quite a difference between the two and but the main difference is there is no smell of onion or garlic with the poisonous lookalikes the other one is a lily of the valley and you can see those cute little white bells and how they clearly show you that they're not ramps ramp flowers are maroon and don't look at all like that however before the flowers come out if you just looked at that leaf it really would look like ramps so there again just be careful and smell and see if it smells garlicky okay so one way that I like to preserve ramps is making compound butter and the recipe for that will, will be in my I'm not really sure how to put recipes up on patreon but I'm gonna learn and um, all that is is just chopped up ramp and some lemon zest lemon juice some salt and pepper and some good organic butter and then you just mix that really well and then roll it into a into a tube with some plastic wrap and then stick it in the freezer this is such a wonderful way to use it all year long and you just take out a little dollop of it a little slice of it and put it on top of salmon or pork or green beans or whatever you're you're eating and it's just so delicious and all your seasoning is ready to go um, another thing I did just recently was make ramp salt and I dehydrated the leaves and then um, I did this with my friend Kimberly Tyler and she's also a wild blessings enthusiast and so in her blend she added sea salt and some dried Japanese knotweed and some lemon zest and uh, papaya seeds for this pepper and anyway that'll be a great way to keep her ramp salt uh, that was just a fun thing for her to take home to remember our time together but it's a great way to preserve ramps through the whole year all right so here's another delectable edible that's out right now for the no one in the picking this is wild ginger actually this is cohosh wow. Blah. I call this cohosh. hey max where's my boy still looking for wild ginger i've got lots of tooth wart and violets and glass and vine tendrils and got some ramps but what I really want is wild ginger. Oh, there it is. How unusual this leaf shape is. So beautiful. Love, love, love this plant. Love the flower. And I can't believe what a difference a week makes. It's incredible. Everything is leafing out. What you doing, Max? <laughs> okay so this video shows how to make the uh, what to do with the wild ginger and so I did a lot of Indian cooking this week and I used quite a bit of it in my recipes look at that flower isn't that weird it's down way below the leaves so you have to look for them and make sure you look for it with your jeweler's loop. It's just fascinating. So I chopped up the entire plant, the stems and the leaves and the roots. And um, I put that into a decoction of water. So let's see. Um, all right, so I took all of that I just showed you and I put it maybe in probably three cups of water and I simmered it for a good 20 minutes so that um, I could get all of the good flavor. Then I took that three cups of ginger water and I added one cup of sugar until it melted and then I bottled it up. 
what I did to make a drink is I took tonic water and ice cubes and I added the ginger syrup to taste and it tasted just like ginger ale only it was so much better and it was so fun to do this I've never tried this before but I've made many many wild syrups and just the ratio is a one to three so if you're gonna do six cups of decocted ginger water then you would use two cups of sugar and then just add however much you want to your tonic water um, to make a soda it was so yummy okay so here is another place that I love so you just got to see one of my woods nearby that I love to go to and this is another place I enjoy this is the Todd Island Park this is at the far tip and we're looking not at an edible plant this is a buckwheat uh, buckeye tree and you can see its new flower inflorescence the buds that are just starting and it's kind of exciting even though it's not edible I just so enjoy watching the evolution of that the morphine of that tree but this is such a wonderful place where I get my Japanese knotweed and I get my garlic mustard and oh um, gallium aparine and chickweed and so many wonderful things and plus the rivers there so to, here's just a short video of the magic of the Todd Island Park and I absolutely love this river the new river here we go Max loves it here too Okay, so one of the things that I've learned about Japanese knotweed, I, we're kind of at the end of collecting it because it's only an early spring shoot, but I have harvested it over seven times at the island park. And what I've discovered is that these little early shoots keep coming back. So if you, because the roots are so determined, this, is, this plant is not to be denied. So if you continually harvest, you'll continually have something to harvest because it'll just pop up at another place. So that's kind of a wonderful way to extend the harvest, which was something that I had not really considered before, but I want to have a freezer full of this stuff. I use it almost every morning with my smoothie um, because of the resveratrol. It's the highest plant with resveratrol in it, which remember we talked about in our um, Teaching Tuesday class when we talked about Japanese knotweed. It stands for reverse it all. It's just such an amazing healing um, constituent in this plant and it's highest in this plant than in any other and since this actually is taking over the planet we might as well learn to eat it if you can't beat it eat it so over here are the um, see the peels on the outside I like to peel them off because they are, tend to be a little bit stringy but um, sometimes when they're really young they don't have to be peeled at all they're just juicy they have that wonderful lemony flavor and what I've learned is that they actually soak in whatever flavor you're using so 
if you're using um, chicken broth and Parmesan cheese and different spices, it'll pick up those flavors. And if you're doing something sweet, it'll pick up those flavors too. And it's just so delicious. I love it. Okay, and then cattail is a major wild source. Uh, it's a very useful plant and a wild food source. And it, it, has, it does have poisonous lookalike of an iris. And so they tend to grow in the same area. So cattails are oval at the base and the iris is flat at the base. I probably should have put a picture of that, but I will be going to the cattail pond this week and I will definitely show you in a video the difference. But I wanted to put this up because these are on the nature shelves right now. So the um, make sure you go to a place where there's no pollution because these will pick up um, the pollution like nothing else. They just suck up the, um, the toxins. So it's a great way to cleanse water is with a cattail chute, but it's not a place to forage if you don't have a clean location. Um, the chutes taste just like cucumbers and they can be used to thicken soups and they have analgesic and antiseptic properties. There's kind of a sliminess to it, which is very healing and can be used for lots of things as well. I love to ferment the shoots and put them in mason jars with ramps and keep them that way or freeze them works well as, as, as well. So we'll, we'll be doing a whole class on cattail because it just has so many offerings. But this time of year, uh, last time I talked about cattails, I was talking about using the roots for bread and this time I'm talking about using the shoots for cucumbers and so this is the time to get them. So we talked about bulbs and roots and we talked about um, shoots of the Japanese knotweed and the cattails and then the next one we're going to discuss is the poke shoots which are out now as well but I would wait until you come to my Teaching Tuesday class this coming week because this is the one I'm featuring and it is an amazing plant that actually kept the south alive it has so many folklore and so many stories to it it's fascinating and infamous and it can also be toxic so it's not one of those early it's not one of those um wild edible plants that a beginner would want to just delve into and eat and you surely don't want your kids to treat this lightly either so come to class and learn because it is just an incredible gift okay and then milkweed shoots are my probably my favorite shoots and um but they have a poisonous look alike and the only time they actually look alike is when they are shoots so is this milkweed or is this dogbane i'm not sure usually dogbane is a little skinnier um but i'm gonna wait until um more of them pop up and i can figure it out and we'll be doing a whole class on milkweed as well so Okay, so we just did the roots and shoots, and so now we're going to get into wild edible leaves. So this is a fun thing to do. It's an educational thing to do as well. So if you're homeschooling or if you just are a crafty person, just get some white uh, gift bags like this and use packing tape, and then have your kids or yourself collect all of the edible leaves that you've learned about and put them, decorate the bags with them. So you can use that for gifts or just for fun to uh, remember what you've been learning about. These are trout lilies, and if you find one, you probably can find a hundred because they love to grow in colonies. They love moist woods near water and rich, rich soil. So they've got a kind of like a succulent quality, mucilaginous, very tasty uh, trail nibble, and they're so good in salads, but I don't think I would ever cook them. I just think they're good raw, but, um, they're also kind of a spring ephemeral and if you haven't found them by now you probably won't because they come and they go all right so here are some more edible leaves this is wood sorrel on the left you can see those cute little um, trifoil leaves those are little leaflets there's three little leaflets on each leaf and they're shaped like hearts a lot of people confuse them with red clover, but when we get to red clover, you'll see there's quite a bit of a difference. There's not hearts with red clover. This is what the shamrock was um, designed from, was the wood sorrel. 
so high in nutrition and also the sheep sorrel has a very similar lemony flavor both of them are crunchy and delicious um, sheep sorrel is one of the herbs in the famous Essiac cancer fighting tea blend um, so there's just a lot of power packed in these these wild edibles but one uh, little caveat is that they both are high in oxalic acid so if you've got kidney issues kidney stone issues or whatever then I would avoid these plants unless you cook them because when you cook them um, they turn from this bright green to a kind of an olive green and then that means the oxalic acid has been neutralized many many cultivated plants have oxalic acid in them as well like spinach and kale and so it's not just wild edibles that have oxalic crystals in them um, the reason why oxalic acid is a concern is because it hastens the elimination of calcium from the body and inhibits absorption of calcium so if you eat these raw then just limit the number of leaves that you actually eat but it shouldn't really hurt you if you don't have kidney issues but if you do just cook it that's all all right and then violets are so fun I just love this plant all of the leaves come from one place and they spread in a circle and they're tightly curled into the center rolled up from each side into the middle of the leaf and as the leaves grow larger and older the coils relax and open into a heart shape so you can see them kind of coiled up here and they're this one's completely open into a heart shape and it's got this little kind of a, a light serrated margin the flowers are my favorite part because they're not real flowers they're fake flowers they don't set seed there's no sex parts to them they're just for fun out of the sheer exuberance of spring they're kind of a harbor harbinger of spring you can eat these leaves throughout the whole summer um, they're very moistening and I'll never forget one time hiking um, way up in the mountains behind uh, Molly's branch and I didn't have any water with me and so it was hot and I just went from violet leaf to violet leaf to keep my mouth moist so they're they're wonderful and we'll probably one day spend a whole teaching Tuesday on violets because it's got so many gifts and so many blessings wild blessings okay and then the red clover see the difference here between this and the oxalis or the wood sorrel um, they're not shaped at all like hearts this is an amazing plant um, it's high in antioxidants and vitamin E it's got calcium chromium magnesium potassium and protein and it has 10 times more photoestrogen or phytoestrogen than soy does very nourishing to the body or to the blood it builds strength and it's considered a fertility herb uh, where it actually will regulate menstrual cycles this too the flower of the red clover is in the Essiac tea blend that um, the sheep sorrel is also in and so is burdock okay so lots to say about red clover um, an amazing amazing plant especially for women health but I love to use the leaves and salads and I have quite a bit of it in my refrigerator right now and I've been eating it a lot so it's interesting uh, Linda Runyon has a lot to say about how much red clover would give her the energy to keep hiking when she was foraging um, living off the land okay this is not necessarily a leaf well it is a leaf but it's a vine and uh, this is wild grape leaves look how, how tender they are at this stage and how different the shapes are of the leaves the same plant same vine and different shapes but um, these leaves are good for sa in salads right now and as they get a little older they're great to use to, in brining in a salt salt brine so that you can um, make them into dolmates which is wonderful with Greek cooking and so I'll give you recipes for that when we get to that point and this is plantain and this, the only time it's really tasty to eat these plants or the plantain leaves is in the early spring so this is the best time to forage for plantain leaves this is plantago major but the plantago lanceolata is the long-leafed plantain and they have the same taste and the same medicinal properties 
such an amazing medicinal plant and this has been called the first aid plant it has a drawing power that's just infamous so if you get bit by a bee or a spider even rattlesnake bites this is famous for you being used to draw out infection and poisons and the best thing to do the quickest thing to do if you get stung by a bee is just to find a piece of plantain leaf and chew it up right away and then take that moistened chewed it's called a spit poultice and put it right over the bee sting and it will draw out the, the toxins and the, the stinger uh, or splinters even I've used it for splinters there's so many uses for this amazing plant and so I really recommend getting to know it and this is I've, the only thing I've ever cooked with this is I've made kale chips out of them and if you do want to put it in a salad, and I've done that many, many times, you want to make sure that you cut it against the grain because of the unbelievable fibers that go in the uh, ribs of this leaf. So if you cut it against the grain, then it, you won't have that problem. Okay, so those are the leaves and the roots and the shoots. And now we'll get into flowers. This picture on the left is not my picture, but kudos to whoever took that. I found it off the web. But um, look at all those beautiful, what an amazing salad that is. So just some of the edible spring flowers that are available right now are violets, wild strawberries, red buds kind of out of vogue right now, but it was so amazing while it was lasting. And then dandelion, spring beauties pretty much gone as well. Trout lilies are yellow, black locust, wisteria, mustard, and here on the right is a um, flowers that Pamela brought for Brooke's birthday. And do you see how it's a mustard flower? They have the four petals and the six stamens, four tall and two short. So these flowers here are mustard flowers and all mustard flower, all mustards are edible, but the flowers are particularly fun to eat in salads. And uh, I've learned that when I'm working with edible flowers and I want to collect them, I just make a bouquet of them, put them in water, and then I can use it fresh right on my counter in my salads as I am preparing a meal. So that's just a nice hint, a little tip. Okay, and then of course trilliums, they've been out for a while and they're wake robin because they come up before the wake, robins even come and they're, they're endangered, so be careful. But you might want to just sample one just to see what they taste like. Um, they're so beautiful. And um, if you do, just take one leaf off of the pl each plant instead of all of them. If you take the leaves off, they're kind of the energy factories for the whole plant. You'll kill the plant. So just letting you know. There's Max looking handsome in a different woods with the trilliums below. Okay, so these edible tips I've been just absolutely picking out on. These are green briar. Another word for it is cat's briar or smilex. And these are the tendrils. This is a, or blasphemy vine is my favorite term for it. These things absolutely will take over a forest and they become really woody and thorny and they will choke trees. So I've spent hundreds of hours ripping them out of my woods because I don't want them there. But I do love having access to the tendrils and so they're all over the mountain. So I just have collected literally hundreds of these in the past few weeks and put them in every salad. They're very crunchy. Even those thorns are at this point, um, you just want to take off the part that's really flexible and juicy and that's delicious. They're high in um, testosterone and also many vitamins and minerals. The spruce at this point is a good time to harvest and it feels like, like a little kush ball. Um, eat them raw. Just chop them up and throw them in your salad. You can also make a vinegar out of them, like a balsamic vinegar. And you can also dry them for teas throughout the, the winter. Okay, so edible trees. So this is sassafras. And the, this is just like redbud. Redbud flowers come out before the leaves do. So the leaves are now out on the redbud trees, but the flowers are gone. And the sassafras flowers came out before the leaves come out. So I ate a lot of sassafras flowers. They have got a wonderful crunch and they're beautiful yellow, unusual flowers. And, um, but the leaves are strange because they are like mulberries. They have three different leaf shapes on the same tree. 
So you can see here, there's one lobe, and there's the mitten, the two lobes, and over here is the three lobes, all on the same plant. So that's sassafras, but what's crazy about the leaf is that it's also mucilaginous, which is moistening, and it tastes pretty much like root beer. These stems too are delicious and they make, this is what the root and the bark have been used to make root beer in the past and I've, I'll be teaching you how to make that in the future. But they're also great if you wanna make uh, hot dogs on a stick over a campfire, this is probably the best stick that you can find would be um, sassafras. They're always green. They're green all through the winter, the um, bark of the stems of the branches. So this would be a good edible tree to to cut a um, hot dog for, a st for hot dogs on a stick. Okay, but these make wonderful salad fixins because they're so tender and tasty this time of year. As they get a little older, there's other purposes for them, but they're still going to be um, still good to harvest. This plant is what Daniel Boone, what brought Daniel Boone to the high country. So we'll talk about that when we focus on it befriending sassafras. Okay, this week I went down to Peaceful Valley to help Serene um, plant, transplant some of her plants, and I saw my first spice book, spice bush, which I've never, I don't have one, but I would love to have one, and I've never actually seen one, and so here it is, and they're just beautiful, and they smell like bubble gum. So I don't know what to do with it other than um, I've heard people make spices out of it. I have no idea how that's done, but it's certainly on my bucket list. And I wanted to point out that if you've got a spice bush, this would probably be the time to collect these beautiful blooms and find out what to do with them and then tell me about it. Um, I have been collecting lots of basswood, with, which is a linden tree. Uh, the Tilia Europa is the botanical name. Look at how beautiful the edge, the margin, how serrated that is and the shape of the leaf is a little bit asymmetrical kind of like a witch hazel very tasty these are so um, delicious these are probably the best tasting edible tree leaf and um, their buds are their terminal buds are also really good and the deer really like them so it's kind of hard to to gather them when there's so many deer around because they always get there before I do but I I think it's even worth getting a ladder and collecting some. Okay, and then the next thing that I want to recommend at this time, this week, is pine pollen. So um, pine pollen, it, the best way to collect this is to use like a paper bag and stick it over the branch and then just shake the branch and then collect the powder. The pollen has so many benefits. It balances testosterone, it increases sex drive, it delays aging, it improves muscle growth, it boosts your immune system and has many anti-inflammatory effects. So the way I eat this is just to put it in your pancake batter or into bread if you're making bread or cookies or you could put it in pills and take it that way. But um, I just enjoy putting it into food. Put it in your smoothies. Um, incredible. We, we learned about pine in January. It was my first class with Teaching Tuesday online and um, pine has got an amazing presence and incredible gifts and the trees most every pine tree is edible except for a few but those are in the west coast all right and then we've talked a lot about just seeing trees and watching the watching them unfurl their terminal buds and seeing them blossom and 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 bloom in the spring and it's just so fascinating so this is here at my sit spot and this is a locust tree and the locust trees aren't edible but their flowers are and so they'll be coming um, next but look at how cute these little tiny leaves are and they'll get beautiful and feathery and large of course in time and that little shadow is so cute so just keeping your eyes open and watching these small changes and nuances is wonderful Okay, so that was Nature's Wave, and that was just some of the things I did this week and places I went this week. Eating wild. <laughs> so what did I eat this week? All right. Well, 
the spring beauties are beautiful and they're also spring ephemerals which means they come and go and so they're probably gone by now but they're little tiny um, taters or their little spuds or their um, bulbs taste just like potatoes and so I found some spring beauties that were kind of waning and I knew that in their in the soil I would find these little buds and so sure enough I got um, not very many I only was able to get three but I boiled them and I took off their epidermis first and boiled them and then I put some ramp butter on them and I decided to make like a little fairy tea party so this is a spruce nib and this is a little piece of acorn bread there's the ramp butter there's some red red bud flowers there's those little spring beauty um, tater spuds and there's a blackberry from last year so I thought well if I'm gonna have a fairy tea party I have to need to make a fairy so I made this little forest folk and her name is Maybell Everything about her is made from nature, except for that little bird that I bought. But she's, she's fun. It's fun to play with nature scraps. This week I had some boys over and they made the most amazing things. And I'll show you that next Foraging Friday. Um, the things that they created were pretty special. All right, so back in my kitchen, did a lot of decocting of burdock root. And never throw out the the um the pot liquor the water that you decocted and simmered the burdock in because that becomes your broth for a soup so let me show you what i did with uh, i made a wild noodle bowl which was super tasty and i've got a video in the next slide which shows you what each thing is there and then this is the finished product so let's go to the video the video next so here's max He's always at foot. And this is ramps, and there's some of the bulbs. So this will be delicious. And then I'll use a wild broth of burdock um, pot liquor and some other um, delicious things and toasted sesame oil to make it a, a really nice Asian flavor. <laughs> okay, so back to this picture here. So I took some wontons and I just fried them in coconut oil to put on top. But the broth, I used fish sauce, um, toasted sesame oil, burdock, the pot liquor, and a little bit of soy sauce, and um, some sriracha. So it was super good. I used udon noodles, and um, man, <laughs> this was probably the most tasty dinner I've had in a while, but it was all so good and had all of these wonderful wild ingredients, which means that the nutrition was off the charts. Okay, then I made a sweet and sour burdock root with the honey and the soy sauce and the sesame seeds and the toasted sesame oil. And then I used that to make wild wontons. So let's talk about those ingredients. This was really delicious. So this is the burdock root here. This is kind of like a little <laughs> buffet. But this is Solomon seal shoots that I just briefly steamed. And um, oh, they're so good. And then there's some raw Japanese knotweed and some wild ginger carrots, which have been fermented with wild ginger and um, Japanese knotweed and carrots. And then this here is cream cheese with sriracha and wild, um, wild garlic, you know, the uh, Allium vinali, or I don't know how to pronounce that. Okay. So what you do is you just take the, the wonton wrapper and lay it out flat and then you put in the, the sriracha sauce which is in the cream cheese 
and then just one of each of these things or a little bit of each into the wonton wrapper and roll it up using water as kind of the glue and then you fry it in coconut oil and it was so so delicious okay um, I did a class on fermentation that's one wonderful way to preserve your wild harvest and so pickled uh, wild onions and then I added some ramps to it just yesterday but the wild onions or the wild garlic has kind of this husk on the outside which makes it a little bit um, not tender so just take that part off and up at the top is the you know those chive parts I just chopped that up really small and I'm fermenting that as well so I just decided to add ramps to it because it was not a completely full full jar and that'll be a great way to not only preserve the harvest but to make it more nutritious um, another wonderful way to make bread more nutritious is by using sourdough bread, which is partially digested and the enzymes are already breaking down. And so what I did is I gave my acorn flour from chestnut oak acorn to my friend um, Allison and she baked up this loaf for me and it was really, really good. So yeah, bread doesn't tend to be very good, especially for gut health, but if you have a healthy sourdough starter and you're working with um, like this was made with einkorn and acorn so good stuff and then I made a wild seasoned salt which um, Pamela won with the wild eating contest and in that is dried lemon zest coarse sea salt and I took papaya seeds and dried those and those have a very peppery flavor to them and I also dried some knotweed stalk and then I ground it all together in the coffee grinder and then yeah so she it's right there next to Maybell so she I was able to give that to Pamela because the computer chose her name as the winner of our wild eating contest so that was exciting all right Pamela made this week she made a ramp goat cheese pizza and she also made a wonderful gluten-free chocolate cake with edible flowers decorated on top for Brooke's birthday party. That looks pretty amazing. It was amazing. I was here. And then I made this almost wild sal all wild salad um, with hosta leaves. Early hosta leaves are so tender and delicious. And so those are the lettuce I used in here. Greenbrier tips, knotweed, red bud flowers, spruce tips sassafras leaves, ramps, lilac flowers, dandelion leaf, and then the non-wild non items were just tomatoes, goat cheese, cucumber, and almonds. And it was delicious. And this is pretty crazy. This was my winner this week. This is Suzanne Upton. She made wild kale chips. And so um, <laughs> just, I have so much to learn from this woman. She's amazing. But what she did, and I'll just read what she wrote. She said, I had a big honkin' bowl of wild kale chips made from evening primrose leaves, young yellow dock, wild muscadine grape leaves, plantain leaves, garlic mustard leaves, lamb's quarter leaves, peach leaves, smilax tendrils. Those are the uh, green briar tendrils that we showed you earlier. And some turnip greens from the garden. And she sprinkled them with ramp seasoning and shagbar kickery salt with turmeric. She served them as an appetizer for a couple of neighbors when they came over for salmon steaks with spruce tip and juniper berry salt, scallops with stinging nettle butter, and fried corn with onions and ramps. So, sounds to me like she has a lot to teach all of us. I am so impressed. So the computer picked her as my winner and she's um, getting my wild seed zest seasoning which I don't have a picture of as her her prize so that was fun and she's also going to be sharing um, some of the things she's learned about working with poke this week in our teaching Tuesday so I'm excited about learning from her and Susan Radcliffe made a wild vegan quiche and mint tea so beautiful she said it was delicious and Maggie had to make hers look as beautiful as it tasted, I'm sure. But Maggie makes, she's the queen of beauty and everything she does is beautiful. So she just put ramps in her pasta salad 
and look how pretty that is. That's just eye candy. Okay, and then I decided to take um, Japanese knot weed to a new level, and I have this recipe for Mrs. Fields chocolate chip cookies, which is an amazing recipe. And all I did was just to add some maraschino cherry and cherry juice to some Japanese knotweed, stuck them into my batter and cooked them up and it was amazing. So that was fun. And then the last thing I did with Japanese knotweed, um, which was different, was I added, I made uh, knotweed popovers. So I took strawberries and the Japanese knotweed and I, this is sugar and brown sugar and they just mixed it all together and, and and just stir fried it or not stir fried it but just cooked it in a saucepan until it broke down a bit and then I put it inside of these popovers using a fork to smash down on the edges and then baked them and they turned out so so yummy so that was our cooking session and I'll have recipes for all of these things when I figure out how to do that and then the next thing that we do with Foraging Friday and we do with Teaching Tuesday as well is just talking about the importance of being still and being a human being rather than a human doing. Um, here's a short video of my sit spot. It's just nature stimulates all of the senses. So time in nature just to be, to listen, to observe, to feel, to reconnect the restorative power of nature. Hiking habits and sit spots, um, oh, I can't even tell you how important that is, but I read this fabulous book by Richard Love called um, Last Child in the Woods. I think we should all read it. It's just, in, it's a real wake up call, but he describes the dilemma of children being raised indoors away from the restorative power of nature. And he believes that the more time in nature, it will increase your joy and give you better focus. He calls it green time and um you know not screen time <laughs> and he says that adhd the real disorder is less in the child than it is in the imposed artificial environment to take nature and natural play from a child may be tantamount to withholding oxygen contact with nature is as important as good nutrition and adequate sleep end of quote so i agree with him and I feel the same way about our dogs. I think that Jack Russell Terriers in particular need to be outdoors sniffing and digging and chasing squirrels and just breathing fresh air and being on adventures. So here's Max scampering along our hiking trails and overseeing our sit spot. And there's no better way to um, see the seasons unfold and to get in sync with nature's rhythms than to commit to a hiking habit and a sit spot where you can just soak God in from the outside. Always something of fascination in the kaleidoscope of the clouds, the nuances and textures, the colors, morphing landscapes, and the budding flowers. It just all represents God's love for us and his beauty, his attention to detail, his playfulness, his power, all clearly seen by what he has made and so then this scripture says, rejoice and be glad forever in what I create. And I just say, yes, Lord, I will. So that, that ends our first Foraging Friday together. I've got so many cool ideas about what I'm going to do for future Foraging Fridays. But um, follow me as we go through uh, Nature's Wave. On I'll have some YouTube things I put up as well. But this concludes my May 4th through the 14th. Um, join me next week and we'll follow the energy from the roots to the fruits. Mm -hmm. Learning together, shopping in a variety of wild grocery stores. Um, sitting still and quiet in various settings just to listen to nature's hum. 
and then we'll go back to my kitchen and make a glorious mess and cook up these recipes and um, we'll, we'll be doing some really cool crafts as well and inspire one another to reclaim all of these wonderful green gifts that have been given so freely from our creator um, the recipes will be posted pretty soon for my patreon members and I just want to thank you so much for joining me and I so appreciate your financial support and your encouragement um, this will certainly be such a blessing to me and um, please join our Wild Blessings with Holly Drake Facebook group for next Tuesday as we befriend Phytolaca Americana which was the plant that kept the South alive during the Civil War so that is going to be a fascinating study and it's a free class and I so appreciate you all for joining me and I hope this has been a blessing <music>